Hi there, I'm Alan Udy from the Historical Aviation Film Unit and I'm here at Flair NZ at Te Kofai Airfield near Hamilton in New Zealand talking to Roland Harrison from Hawkeye UAV Limited about their UAV systems and their aerial mapping. So essentially this aircraft is, is optimised for mapping. Um, I think as New Zealand companies we can spread ourselves too thinly so we've decided to go down a commercial uh, aerial mapping and 3D terrain generation route and do that very well. So we started off with the Defence Technology Agency design, which is known as CAHU, and we flew that for about a year, but it really was more for uh, different military applications and not optimised for commercial applications. Uh, and the key thing being the orientations of the cameras and things like that. So we um, had to fly a bigger camera than we could in CAHU, and we applied for a grant from the Ministry of Science and Innovation and got a grant for an R&D project to develop this aircraft and this system. So we see the business really, the business model being really uh, operations in New Zealand to essentially cut the cape thinner for big industry, getting access to uh, project level imagery and, and data because our aircraft is efficient, it operates below cloud and the image processing is very, very quick. Now one of the things why we call it ARIO Hawk is to emphasize ARIOGRAPH, the photogrammetry, the image processing. I can tell you now that 80% of this industry is what happens on the ground after the UAV. But the UAV is 20% and it's the first 20% and you've got to get that right otherwise everything's just a waste of time. So we've incorporated, as I said, a lot of commercial uh, imperatives to make this commercially viable. One of the other uh, things is that we've got an endurance of 90 minutes. And, and that's important because you've got to look at uh, commercially doing areas about 5, 10, uh, square kilometres per flight, otherwise if you're doing two or three or one, you've got a lot of uh, risk and time and effort and uh, the more you uh, can do in the air in one flight, the more economic you are. So the other issue too is we don't need a catapult. Catapults cost money, they need to be maintained um, and for simplicity so you need to get on site, identify where you want to get and going and it needs to operate reliably because if you have launch failure it's a big deal in the commercial UAV industry. You know, you've lost a lot of money getting out there, repairs, maintenance. Plus, typically, weather. Weather affects us, and you've got a weather window, and uh, you've lost the weather window if, you, if you've uh, got a repair to do. It seems that you've done what a lot of Kiwi companies are actually good at doing, which is looking firstly at the need, identifying where you want to go, and then not necessarily having to start from scratch and develop everything yourself, but pull together a whole lot of potentially disparate companies and technologies. Absolutely, um, we're actually market-led, not technology-led, and that's really important. But it's interesting to talk about disparate technologies. We have a precision engineer who's not in the aviation industry who restores six to nine million dollar Bugattis who makes a critical component to this. And uh, when, when this component was given to the Defence Technology Agency, well, they were quite astounded at the quality. And, and that's the other issue too, the aircraft has to be built to an extremely high quality. If we're not producing quality equipment, we have got don't have that competitive edge internationally because everyone's doing a average gear. You've got to be that much better in, uh, as New Zealanders than the rest of the competition, so quality is critical. We bring in uh, image processing, mapping technology, uh, engineering, and we can spread our manufacturing risk across multiple partners. So you mentioned obviously that the 80% of what's going on is what happens after the flight in terms of dealing with the data and processing of images. Um, Ariograph, do they have to, to, to change much to do what you actually require? There was a significant development that these guys had to do and uh, frankly their, their technology is world leading. And the critical thing is that most photogrammetry or technology is optimised for aeroplanes that fly six. 9,000 feet, we capture five or 100 images, but we're using wide angle lenses at low altitude, which has its own unique lens physics. So they had to do a lot of development uh, with us, and so um, we're using uh, a new technology known as cloud computing. So a lot of our, our technologies in the server environments, which means we can grow and scale very, very quickly in that uh, photogrammetry environment. And having things in the server means that our client in Brazil can upload data very efficiently and get back data within a day or two, which is, which is outstanding. 
traditional uh, image processing takes weeks or months to, to do work. So. Is there any one industry where you think the, the imagery that you produce is going to be a benefit or is it wide ranging? Well mainly uh, at the moment it seems to be mines and aggregates who are the people that are dealing the most in 3D volumes but I think really what you're saying where is the utility in imagery? It's, it's in multiple industries. Uh, there's a little bit of military application here but I think they're really going to benefit from the advances and the implementation on the commercial side, which is where a lot of people, I think, they try and chase the military market. But it, I think the worm's turned on that. You know, militaries are increasingly looking at uh, success in the commercial market there. And that, uh, and even then, I don't really see the military as a, a, a major market for this. The biggest industries, I think, will be mining, roading, engineering. And this is what we call a project-level uh, acquisition. It's not competition for the you know, the aerial photography aircraft that are operating doing very large areas. So for them this is very inefficient work but optimum for our, our business. So so in terms of the, the aircraft itself, you know, from, from somebody with an earth science background, I mean I'm looking at this as a field exercise, so I'm out in the back of WA looking for minerals. I mean what sort of team is going to be required to operate this? Typically two people. Uh, you have the ground control station is just one laptop. Uh, for this type of work you don't need a live video feed, you can have one, but it's not really required. Uh, but really, just to make it easy, two people is optimum. One to launch the aeroplane, one to um, fly it. And typically that second person acts as an observer to, to keep you clear of other aeroplanes, to keep your operations safe. Because you typically hear aeroplanes before you see them. For, for again, somebody in, in industry who sees a, a great opportunity here for acquiring the imagery they need, What's it going to take in terms of hours for somebody to learn to actually become an operator of, of your vehicle? Well, that's an interesting point because we've been working with ATTO and the CAA on licensing and uh, you don't need to be a pilot but you need to be a member of the aviation community. You have to understand airspace and all sorts of things. So if you are looking at around about, I think, seven weeks of training and it's, it's not a trivial amount. It, even though the aeroplane is small, there's a lot of money tied up in the sensors and a lot of money tied up in the effect and the task. So you really need professional people doing it. Uh, I think it's very easy to do, but you just need to go through a, a methodical step to make sure that uh, you're part of the aviation environment so you, you fit in and, and integrate into that, not expect the world to integrate into you. It's a critical thing. To actually operate the, learn to operate the aeroplane is quite easy. You probably take about two weeks and you're, you're pretty much on the, on the cards.